Well, good morning, friendship. How y'all doing? Doing all right, huh? Got our smile on today, and we in church, or either we're in the parking lot, or, or either we're at home on quarantine, uh, seems like. Um, got got a, a lot going on. Uh, I'm glad that uh, you're here today, and, and I want to just kind of give you a few announcements, and, and then we'll kind of move forward with our with our service today. Um, got my sticky notes here. We, uh, this past week, kind of had to take a step back and, and kind of reassess our services and, and try to take some extra precautions. Uh, as you know, um, our, our COVID cases in, in our county, uh, particularly in Brookhaven, uh, are, are on the rise. I mean, they're, they're spiking. Um, it's a pretty serious situation. Uh, a lot of people in our community are, are dealing with COVID right now, um, as well as in our country, but particularly in our community. Um, <clears throat> this past Wednesday night, uh, we had direct exposure uh, on a Wednesday night um, in our children's group and so forth, and, um, and possibly uh, some of our youth as well. And, and uh, so we uh, wanted to take a step back and kind of reassess and, and put some precautions uh, in, in place as we kind of move forward and kind of navigate through that and give that some time. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that we were doing today is, is having our regular services at 10 and 5 and, um, and for in-person for you that want to come in and also parking lot and YouTube as we normally do. And then we were, we're suspending Children's Church today and as well as our Sunday school activities and, and youth stuff and that'll go through, when, that'll go through Wednesday. Uh, we'll meet again. Uh, our deacons will, will get together and, um, and and talk Wednesday night and kind of assess the situation. We figured that'd give it about a week from uh, from when we had the exposure, just to kind of see what happens and takes place within um, you know our church family and some of the uh, some of the folks that were exposed there. Um, so we'll meet, we'll assess the situation, and, and see where we need to go uh, service-wise uh, moving moving forward. And, uh, and also, <clears throat> and the biggest thing is uh, we just ask everybody to take some extra precautions as, as, we, uh, as we move through this. We don't want to get to the situation um, uh, where, where we, um, you know, have to not have in-person services. Uh, we're going to do every, everything we can to, to offer in-person services as, as well as parking lot and YouTube and continue uh, to do that. So, uh, so please be in prayer that, that we can move forward because, uh, hey, we, we need... Uh, we need to be together. We need to be in church together. We need to be worshiping the Lord because, honestly, uh, he's our only hope in all of this, right? And uh, he, he's our healer. And so, uh, so that's just, um, just to kind of update, just wanted to give you on that. Uh, we'll, <clears throat> we'll be reposting um, after Wednesday uh, of kind of how we'll move forward. And so please uh, pay attention for that. All right. Want some good news? All right. We had a... Had a baby born uh, this week in our church family, and that's uh, Macy Rose Smith, and she was born to Austin and Rebecca Smith, and so we praise the Lord uh, for, for this precious little one. That's a beautiful little girl there, and uh, you, uh, it has a picture in, in the bulletin, and so we want to congratulate Austin uh, and Rebecca. They had a little touchy time. Uh, Rebecca tested positive uh, for COVID uh, when they got to the hospital for the baby. And, uh, but praise the Lord, uh, everything went well and everything went good with the baby and, uh, and, they're, doing, and they're doing good now too. So, uh, so we want to um, praise the Lord for that and, and give them a congratulations. Uh, <clears throat> food pantry, we came out of our summer food program. Um, uh, we, we did really well with that. We delivered about 17 uh, food bags per week uh, throughout the summer. Um, one of the things that came out of that is, uh, is a talking about maintaining that food pantry. Um, and, and just keeping keeping that and being able to use that uh, throughout the year where, where we see uh, needs. So if you'd like to uh, be a part of uh, the food pantry or donating to that, you can contact Robin Vaughn or uh, Misty Holcomb. Uh, the youth have a fundraiser, Rada uh, Cutter, Cull Cuttery, there we go, I'll get that out, and uh, kitchen items, and that's there in the bulletin, and if you'd like to help uh, with that. Is there any other announcements that you need to make today? Any other announcements that need to be made? I have one other announcement. 
uh, a shout out, um, and hopefully they're in the parking lot today, I, I think that they are, uh, but uh, Denise, um, she happens to be uh, on quarantine this week as well, and when um, they, they have COVID in the family, Doug and Brenda, so we want to be praying uh, for, for them uh, through all of this, um, but we want to shout out to uh, Denise this morning, today's her birthday, and uh, so uh, happy birthday to you, Denise, and uh, you can see me on YouTube later. So uh, we, we love you, and I uh, wish uh, she was able to be in here. We could we could all uh, sing to her. But uh, so we want to tell her happy happy birthday. So let's uh, we'll get started with our with our worship today, and and as we get started, um, let's just stand with me if you would, and and let's just uh, have an opening prayer, and then we're going to uh, we're going to pray for some some uh, of our issues that we're facing uh, today. Lord, as we come into your presence today as, as your church, as your people, Lord, whether we uh, are in the sanctuary or in the parking lot or, or whether uh, we're watching at home on, on YouTube, Lord, I, I pray that you would be with us today and that you would lead and guide our, our services today. And Lord, may we set our minds on you. May we focus uh, on Jesus today the author and the perfecter of our faith. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, as we get started this morning, there's a couple things that, um, that, that obviously are big issues that the church needs to be praying over and, and praying about. Uh, you may be keeping up with uh, the crisis, the situation in Afghanistan, what's taking place there. And I was reading about some of this uh, Last night, and and it, it, this is a this is a horrible situation. Um, with the fall to the, the Taliban, uh, there's so much brutality. Uh, there's executions that are taking place. Uh, the Taliban has blocked access of the airports and exit routes of the country. Um, the, it's really a life and death situation for for Christian missionaries, uh, for other Christians, for even other uh, religious minorities uh, with, within, their, within their country. And um, this is just a terrible situation. Um, we want to join together uh, with other uh, Christians and other churches uh, today. Uh, Franklin Graham, uh, as well, is having a day of prayer in relation to this. And, and we want to join in prayer as well today uh, for our brothers and sisters and for these people that that, that are struggling under this evil right now. So, so if you would, um, let's take time. I just want to ask you to, to, to lift up some prayers right now. Uh, just bow your head and, and just bow before the Lord in your heart and pray specifically for this situation. It looks like uh, the hand of God and, and a miracle uh, from God is, is what's going to help most of these people. And so we need to be praying for that. So would you pray with me? Lord, we come before you this morning and we just bow in your presence. Lord, you are the sovereign God of, of all creation. Lord, you're sovereign over nations as well. Lord, we, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ and for your servants and for your missionaries, Lord, that, that are trapped, Lord, in this country now. And that are facing, Lord, the threat of their lives and, and this, this evil. And Lord, I, we pray, Lord, for your sovereign will for them. Lord, that, that your hand would deliver them. And that Christ would be glorified through them. We pray, Lord, for, for all the citizens, Lord, of Afghanistan that, that are suffering and threatened. We pray for those that have had to watch their family members be executed. And Lord, we pray for your mighty hand, Lord, to resolve this situation. And 
we pray, God, for, for Christ to be lifted up in the midst of it. And we ask, God, that you would do your work as only you can. Because, Lord, human armies, human authorities only have so much ability. But, Lord, you are the God of, of all. And, Lord, you can work where no man can. Your word says, Lord, do not put our trust in kings and in horses and armies, but to put our trust in the living God. And I pray, God, that you would work in this situation for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We also, many of us, as you know, uh, we, we all know people, family members, friends that, that are dealing with COVID right now. And... Um, and that are really sick right now. And we want to take time uh, to pray specifically uh, for, for those folks this morning and, and, and to lift them up. Um, uh, they need prayers, and we need God to, to work and, and, and to bring healing uh, to people's lives and comfort uh, as well. Um, COVID is, if you've had it or you've had to watch a family member suffer with it, you know it's the real deal. It, it's a it's a terrible virus. It's a bad thing, and um, and as as we look to the Lord and seek His guidance, you know, we're called to walk by faith and and not by fear. We're called to to walk with wisdom as well, and uh, and to take measured steps uh, as, as we try to address issues in our lives. So this morning. And we have a number of people uh, right now in our church family and in our community. And so what I'd like to ask for you to do is, is to bring to mind the, the folks that you know that have COVID right now and, and to lift them up and, and to pray uh, for them. Um, I know there's a lot of people you know, in, in our church family. I don't want to uh, call every name because I'll miss somebody. <laughs> but, uh, but I want you to think about individuals to pray for and to lift up. Um, I do want to make a special request as well. Um, Brother Gene Douglas, his wife, who preached revival for us um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Brenda, uh, she was here with me throughout the revival. Um, she remains on the ventilator at this time, but is 90%. And uh, so, so please, uh, just remember them in our prayers uh, as well. And lift up God's servants on what they're going through right now. So would you, would you pray for folks at this time? Today, if you're in the parking lot or, or watching on YouTube and, and you have COVID or your family member's dealing with COVID, we want to pray for you today and lift you up as a body of Christ and know that, that God is bigger, He is stronger than any virus or any issue that we go through or anything that we deal with. And we look to Him, Scriptures tells us over and over again, to look to God as our hope, to look to God as our healer. And so, Lord, as, as a church, Lord, we lift up our family members, we lift up our friends, we lift up those within the body of Christ, Lord, right now that, that, that are sick with this virus and that are dealing with it. And we pray, God, for Your mighty hand upon them, for Your mercy, for Your grace, for Your healing. And we pray, Lord, that through all of this, Lord, Lord, that, that we would look to you. We would focus, Lord, on you as the author, the perfecter of our faith. That we would measure our steps according to your will. And Lord, that we would seek your grace and your guidance. And Lord, we pray for your comfort. Lord, I pray for those that have lost their loved ones. 
in the past year and recently, Lord, uh, to COVID, as well as to other things. But Lord, we got many in our church family, Lord, that are grieving. And Lord, I pray for your comforting presence with them and your strengthening of them by your gracious hand. Lord, remind us of what you tell us in your word. Help us to grab a hold of it in faith, to claim it in our lives. Lord, to live by it every day. Would you stand with me, please, as the church? In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For in this hope we are saved. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And we know, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good. For those who are called according to His purpose. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all. How will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, our distress, our persecution, our famine, our nakedness, our danger, our sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed, slaughtered all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Say that with me, church. In all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all the church said, Amen.
Just suppose God searched through heaven. He couldn't find one willing to be the supreme sacrifice that was needed. That would die. Wow, man, thank you, Tim and Rochelle, uh, for leading us today, and, and uh, I praise the Lord for that song. What, what a great reminder. I mean, where would we be uh, if it wasn't uh, for Jesus and the cross, right? And uh, that's, that's our hope. Romans chapter 12, uh, we've been in Romans chapter 12, and, and when you look there in, in Romans chapter 12, you, you see really a concise summary uh, of what it means to accept uh, the gospel, to accept Christ into your life and then to live that out in your life. And so that's what you see in Romans chapter 12 very concisely. And, um, and I tell you, if you take this chapter in your life and you go verse by verse and you make it your goal to understand that verse and to live by that verse, you will be transformed into the image of Christ and you will live a life of transformation. You will change other people's lives also. Romans chapter 12, it's that powerful. As we start there, I think about this little joke that, that I read years ago. You know, we have a Brotherhood. Brotherhood cooks uh, first Sunday of every month, and we started doing that for Sunday school at, at 8.30 in the morning. Uh, men get up here early, and, and we cook, and we cook uh, eggs and bacon and grits and biscuits and all those types of things. And uh, so I was thinking about this chicken and this pig. And they were having this conversation. And so the chicken, the chicken, and we got some folks in our church that have chickens. And, and uh, praise the Lord, some of them give me eggs. And I like that. And so this chicken and the pig are having conversation about our brotherhood break. And so the chicken tells the pig, hey, I got this great idea. You know, breakfast at the church is coming up this Sunday. So why don't we provide a wonderful, wonderful meal of bacon and eggs for the church? Well, the pig thought about it a little bit, and, and then he responded, 
well, for you, that's a small sacrifice. But for me, that's a total commitment. Now think about that. A total commitment. When you come to the Christian life and to live out that Christian life, that's what it requires. It requires a total commitment. When you look in the book of Romans, what you find is, is the theme is the righteousness of God. In Romans 1 through 11, Paul is explaining how we as sinners can become the righteousness of God. How we can be made right with God and have the righteousness of God in our lives. And Paul says that that comes, the righteousness of God comes through us being justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when you get to Romans chapter 12, Paul, Paul changes direction. Where do you go from having the righteousness of God in your life and being right with God? That is translated into living out that righteousness within your relationships and within your life. And the key point to that, from having the righteousness of God in your life to living that righteousness of God through your life, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. That you are a living sacrifice. That is a total, full commitment of your life. A sacrifice requires death. Sacrifice also in Scripture required giving your best. You brought your best to God. It represented the fact that there was an offering made to cover your sin, to make you right with God. So in turn, you are offering yourself. You are dying to yourself and offering yourself fully to God. That is a living sacrifice. That living sacrifice, when you follow Paul's thought in Romans chapter 12, the living sacrifice leads to the renewing of your mind. That you come to think in a biblical perspective. You come to think of your life. and You come to understand God and to think of your life in relation to God's word and God's will. From a living sacrifice to the renewing of your mind, you come to knowing and being in the will of God, which is best for your life. This connects you to the living church, which is the body of Christ, the manifestation of Christ in the community and in the world. And then that is to be lived out. So the Christian life is to be lived out in relationship with the body of Christ. And then Paul moves into verse 9. And he finishes this chapter on what it looks like to to not only be a living sacrifice connected to the living church, but to be a living Christian. And by living Christian, I mean that you are actually living out the principles of the kingdom of God within your relationships and through your life. And so that's what he moves into. And we see there in verse 9 that Paul says that the foundation of this... The foundation of living out the principles of God in your life is sincere love. That these principles that are to be lived out as a living sacrifice require your commitment. We talked about it last week, a commitment to sincere love. A commitment to serving the Lord. A commitment to growing spiritually and a commitment to sharing of your life with others. And so Paul continues these commitments. And Paul, as he crafted this passage of Scripture, I told you last week that it's like a, an, an expanding circle and contracting circle. Paul talks about yourself, your relationship, your commitment to the Lord, and then how that expands to your relationships with one another within the church, and how that expands to your relationships to those outside of the church in the community, back to the church, back to yourself. So this is a dynamic relationship that takes place in your life as a Christian. And so when he comes to verse 14, he expands that relationship beyond the walls of the church, beyond the relationships of the church, to those who are not only outside of the church, but to those who actually hate you as a Christian for your faith, to those who actually hurt you, to those who actually persecute you, and how the Christian life is to respond to that. So let's look here at verse 14 as we read this passage together. Bless those who persecute you. 
bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony. It's also translated, be of the same mind. Live in harmony, be of the same mind with one another. Do not be proud. Paul constantly reminds us of that. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with the humble or with people of low position. Do not be conceited. That's also translated, don't have a high opinion of yourself. What's the difference between pride and being conceited? Pride is the attitude that you present to other people. Conceit is your own opinion of yourself is too high. And so let's talk about what Paul is addressing here in our relationships because I want you to make this connection that if you are a living sacrifice and that is your reasonable act of worship before God. That is the way that you respond to God's grace. That is the way that you live out your reverence to God, your, your fear of Him, so to speak. As God, you are a living sacrifice. So if you are a living sacrifice, then there are certain things that you are committed to in your life. You follow me? So being a living sacrifice translates to being a living Christian connected to the living church. And this involves commitment. So we talked about these other commitments. Now let's look at the commitments that Paul is making here. These commitments that are required in your life in order to be a living sacrifice translated to be a living Christian. In verse 14 you see that it is a commitment to the love of God toward all. It is a commitment to the love of God toward all people. Now in verse 9 Paul begins with love. Genuine, sincere love, love that is without hypocrisy, as the foundation of the Christian life and the motivation for every other commitment that we make in following Jesus. Now Paul expands this commitment to the love of God to those who are not only outside of the church, but to those who hate you and to those who have hurt you. This is where it gets real. This is where you start separating out those who really follow Jesus or who are striving to follow Jesus and those who just want to talk about it. Because the Christian principle of the love of God in, as a response to the persecution of your, in your life is truly unique. That's why it requires a renewing of your mind so that you come to look at other people, even those who per persecute you, you come to look at them through the love of God and according to the grace of God. The same grace that you have been given. Because according to every natural instinct of our human heart, retaliation and condemnation are the appropriate responses when people attack you and when people hurt you. Right? You persecute me, you hurt me, you should have to pay the price for that, right? Is that right? Isn't that how we feel? When you are falsely accused, when you are slandered, when you are hurt, when you are persecuted, and when you are persecuted for trying to do the right thing, oftentimes our response is, well, they should pay for that. It's only fair. Justice should be served. But look here what Paul says. And what Paul says is based on the teachings of Jesus. Paul says... Bless those who persecute you. Bless them and do not curse them. Now that word bless brings along with it the, this implication. Pray for. Pray for. So we are to be praying for the people who hurt us and attack us and hate us rather than demanding that they pay for their sin. To bless one's enemies is not just to do good to them, but to bless one's enemies is to actually ask God for their well-being. This is the way Jesus put it in Matthew 
chapter 5, 43 through 48. He said, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. That you may be His children. God's children respond differently to hate. God's children respond differently to persecution than the world. Rather than demanding people pay for their sin... God's children want to pray for them. He said, for he makes, this is God, this is his character, for he makes his son, his son, he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. God at heart is gracious and God at heart is loving. It's part of his character. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same thing? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do that? Jesus said, even unbelievers respond well to those who respond well to them. Even unbelievers love those who love them. And do good to those who do good to them. But a child of God is different. They respond according to the love of God. And that requires a commitment. Fully accepting Jesus' teaching as the standard in which we live by. And following Jesus' example in our relationships toward those who hate us, toward those who hurt us. Consider Jesus' own example. The very innocent Son of God who deserved to be recognized and who deserved to be worshipped was hated, slandered, arrested, spit upon, beaten, convicted, unjustly, unfair in his trial, sentenced to death as a criminal and crucified. with a criminal on his right and a criminal on his left. And in the Gospel of Luke, do you know what the first recorded words of our Savior who was hanging upon that cross? Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. Commitment to the love of God toward all It is a definite mark that you're a living sacrifice and people will see Jesus in you through that commitment. But look at the next commitment. It is a commitment to compassionate fellowship toward others. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. That is about an emotional connection with other people and with what they are going through and what they are dealing with. If you are a prideful person, you cannot connect with somebody on an emotional level. And therefore, when people are going through, whether it's good things or bad things, when they're going through those things, you will be insensitive and uncompassionate. And that's what pride does to a person's heart. That's why Paul says, Do not be proud, because if you're proud, then you can't connect with people in a way that truly encourages them, comforts them, and helps them. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he said that the body is to have no division, but the members are to have equal concern for one another. And if one is suffering, then all suffer, but if one is honored, then all rejoice. You see, if you have pride when something good happens to somebody, when that good favor turns their way, you'll say, oh, well, they didn't really deserve that. You won't rejoice with them when they get that promotion over you. You won't rejoice with them when when good things happen to them. You'll want to take them down a notch when you're operating in pride. Likewise, when somebody's suffering and when they're hurting... When we're walking in pride, we say, oh, it's just life. 
It's going to happen to everybody. Get over it. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep. Weep with those who weep. That is an emotional connection. That is sharing fellowship. The Bible says that as Christians, we share fellowship in common with one another. I, I, I'm reminded of this, the little boy, and I've told you this before, but he, he was scared to death as the storm came through, and he's, he's hollering for his mama to come get in bed with him because he's scared. And his mom says, you know, son, just go back to bed. You're fine. Everything's fine. Jesus is with you. And the little boy said, Mama, I know Jesus is with me, but right now I need somebody with some skin on. This is what Paul's talking about. Whether it's victories or whether it's defeats, we are to be Jesus with skin on. A commitment to compassionate fellowship with others because it is in that relationship of compassionate fellowship that Christians encourage one another, that Christians support one another, that Christians lift each other up and comfort each other in the good time and in the bad times and praise each other in the good times. You want a great example of, of this in Scripture and you want to be like Jesus? You look at the shortest passage in all of Scripture. And that's John chapter 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. That says it all. It's one of the most beautiful examples of compassionate fellowship. Mary, Martha, just lost her brother Lazarus. If you remember, Jesus came four days after they had requested him to come, right? And as Jesus shows up, Man, the, the, the grief is overwhelming. The grief is so overwhelming that Martha don't even come out to meet Jesus. Now Jesus knows he's the resurrection and the life. Because he tells, he tells them that as well. He says, look, hey, I'm the resurrection, I am the life. Whoever believes in me, even though they die, yet they will live. Jesus had every right to come in and say, man, what's all this crying about? Y'all get over it. I'm the resurrection and the life. Why are you crying about this? And he had every right to say that. When Martha confronted him, Lord, if you would have been here, if you would have came, Lord, when we asked you to come, had every right to put Martha in her place, didn't he? But what does it say? As he stood outside the tomb of Lazarus, what did he do? He cried. He wept with them. What does that tell you? He connected with them on the consequences of the sin of humanity that brought death and on the hurt and the pain that they were going through. He wept with them and then, and then, he gave them comfort, and then he spoke truth, and then he exercised his power as a resurrection and the life. And they got the point. You and I are called to a commitment of compassionate fellowship toward one another. And the last thing that we see is this. It is a commitment to genuine humility toward one another. A commitment of genuine humility toward one another. It says live in harmony or have the same mind as one another. Now, <clears throat> have you ever moved anything with, with a group of guys? You know, usually you, you, you're trying to decide how to, how to get that piece of furniture or how to get that refrigerator in the house and, and you got to navigate the steps, you got to get it out of the back of the truck, you got to navigate the steps, you got to navigate the doorways, and then you got to put it in its place. And so you maybe have three or four guys and they all got their hand. And at first, you know, if you don't talk about it ahead of time, everybody just grabs and starts moving one way or the other. And it's like, whoa, 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 no, 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 put it back down. 
And then you got to get a game plan together. How are we going to get this thing picked up? How are we going to move, right? And then you get to going, and somebody's moving this way, or somebody's pulling that way, and it just ain't working. The idea of living in harmony and being of the same mind is this. We're all pulling in the same direction. We're all exercising our strength and our power for the same purpose. And that requires humility. You see, for, for, to move that piece of furniture, everybody's got to come to that point and say, okay, I'm fixing to submit to how we're going to do this. I might think we need to do it this way. And usually you put four or five, you put three or four guys on moving something, and you're going to get three or four different ways of picking it up and three or four different ways of getting it in the house. But until everybody decides I'm going to pull with the same mind, I'm going to pull in the same direction, I'm going to use my strength in the same way, it's never going to get moved. And so this is what this is what Paul is saying as Christians and as the church. We have to have a genuine humility toward one another because humility is essential. If love is the foundation of the Christian life and the Christian relationship to the church, then humility is the glue that holds it all together. Humility is needed to maintain unity and the fellowship. Humility is needed to get the gospel going and to show the gospel through our lives. And Paul puts all of this in perspective in Philippians chapter 2. And and if you want to look at, hey, Paul says do not be proud. Paul says do not be conceited or have a, a, um, think of yourself more highly than you ought. When Paul says these things, you go to Philippians chapter 2 and you will look there exactly at how your attitude should be. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul tells the church, and it's in the same lines of these verses of Scripture in Romans chapter 12. He says, if you have any comfort from His love, if you you have a common sharing in the Spirit, if tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, Paul says, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. In other words, everybody should be pulling in the same direction. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, or vain conceit, thinking you know better than everybody else. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Look not only to your own interest, but look also to the interest of others. The interest of others should be the priority. And then he says, basically, how we do this. How do we have the same mind? How do we have the same love? How do we come from all these different personalities, all these different opinions, And how do we pull in the same direction? And the only way you do that is found in verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2. And it is the key to living out Romans chapter 16. I mean chapter 12 verse 16. And here it is. Have the same attitude in you as that of Christ Jesus. That's it. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude, the same mindset of Christ Jesus. And what is that attitude or mindset? He was equal to God. He was the eternal Son of God, but yet He denied Himself His privileges as the eternal Son of God, and He entered this sinful world to be our servant, to be our sacrifice, to die in our place for our sin. He chose to do that. He humbled himself. Paul says in chapter Philippians 2, 7, Paul says he made himself nothing, taking the very form of a servant. In other words, he emptied himself. Pride builds barriers that divide us. But humility... That is, the attitude of Christ is what builds bridges that connects us. In order to display genuine humility in your life, there's a few things that are required. You have to adopt the attitude of Christ. You have to be willing to empty yourself. As Paul said, associate with the humble and do not be proud. 
Jesus put it this way. For those that exalt themselves, they will be humbled. But for those that humble themselves, they will be exalted. That means that humility is an exercise. You cannot be humble in your attitude if you do not do humbling things. Just like you can't be loving if you do not do loving things. That's why Paul says that we have to be willing to associate with people of low position, willing to associate with the humble. You can also translate it this way. Accommodate yourself with lowly things. And then get this, willing to do menial work. In other words, you can't be humble unless you are willing to do humbling things. That's why you see Jesus being accused of, why why are you eating with tax collectors and sinners? Why why are you associating with with prostitutes and all of these sick people who are obviously cursed by God as they would have thought in their day? And Jesus would tell them, it's not the well that needs the doctor, it's the sick. And so I'm connecting with the lowly and the humble. Matter of fact, Jesus said, if you're not like a little child, and people were bringing the children to Jesus, and, and the disciples were like, no, 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 this is, this is impri- in, infringing upon the master's time. He don't have time for these lowly little children. Jesus said, if you're not like one of those little children, you're never going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because humility is required. And to be humble, you have to be willing to do humbling things. And the last part of that is this. Do not be conceited. You have to have a godly perspective on your life. Do not be wise, listen to this, in your own opinion of yourself. Do not be wise in your own estimation. That's what that means. And if you want to find that elsewhere in Scripture, you look in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 7. It says in In 5 and 6, trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths, right? But then the verse right after that, in order to trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him so that He can direct your paths. Verse 7 says, don't be wise in your own eyes. And so how do we keep from being conceited? Fear the Lord and depart from evil, Proverbs 3, 7. In other words, everything should be put in perspective of the fact that God's grace and only God's grace has saved us and we're nothing without God's grace. And everything that we do should flow from our respect, our worship, and our desire to express the grace that God has given us to others. Everything should be framed in the wisdom of God and our need for God. And isn't that what you do when you offer yourself as a living sacrifice? Holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable act of worship. That's where it all starts. When you are truly a living sacrifice, you will not have a wise estimation of yourself. You will have a humble view of yourself. And that would translate into everything else that you do. If you remember, Jesus took that towel. Not only did he associate with the lowly and those that were in need, but he took that towel and he washed the feet of his disciples. And he said, I have left you an example for you to follow. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them, Jesus said. So being humble means you're willing to get dirty. Being humble means you're willing to get messy. Being humble means that you're willing to be weary and that you're willing to do those things without recognition. You're willing to do those things without attention. You're willing to do those things when no one else is watching. That you can clean a toilet just as well as you can sing a special. You can do the dirty work when no one knows just as well as you can do the limelight on the stage. 
it comes really down to this basin theology if you think about it. When Jesus stood before Pilate, Pilate took a basin of water. When he had an opportunity to acquit Jesus, he took a basin of water and he washed his hands of Jesus. Had nothing to do with this man. Yet Jesus on the night before he died took, in a, ba- took a basin of water and he washed the feet of the disciples. And this is the choice we all have to make in regarding Jesus. We wash our hands of him, of his attitude and his example Or either we take up our towel and we follow his example. And that's what it means to be a living Christian according to Paul and according to the inspired word of God. It comes down to these commitments that we make to follow Jesus as a living sacrifice. A commitment to sincere love. A commitment to serve the Lord. A commitment to our spiritual growth. A commitment to sharing with others. That's expanded to our commitment to love, to the love of God toward all people. A commitment to compassionate fellowship with others. And a commitment to genuine humility in our attitudes and in our actions toward one another. These commitments lived out in our lives demonstrate our faith and display our witness before the world as the body of Christ. Now... People who have, and we'll close with this, people who have children and grandchildren around the house are constantly reminded of that fact. Even when the children aren't present, there are signs everywhere. You know those crayon marks on the floor? Those toys strode out over the floor? Those handprints on the appliances? Those spills on your expensive car seats and carpet. All those crumbs in your car. Folks with little kids and folks with grandchildren, the signs are everywhere. And nobody has to be present. Somebody can just walk into your house and look at your house and look around and know whether or not you have kids. They can look in your car and know whether or not you have kids. Because the sign of those children are everywhere. They leave in their mark. It's evident. What Paul is saying is that as God's children, as living sacrifices, we leave our mark on the world. We do this through being those living sacrifices, through living out our commitments to follow Jesus. That's why Paul would say, do everything without grumbling or arguing or complaining so that you may be blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and a perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the universe. Lord, thank you for your love for us today and for every day. Lord, if it wasn't for your grace, Lord, we would have no hope. If it wasn't for your faithful love, Lord, we would have no hope. Lord, I thank you for your love, your grace, and your truth that transforms our lives. Lord, I pray that we would see our need on a daily basis to be that living sacrifice so that we can live out the commitments in following Christ in such a way that we display that we display the love and the grace of God through our lives that we display the character of Christ through our lives that we are those witnesses that we are the body of Christ because we are living sacrifices following Jesus Lord I pray for this time of invitation Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts, that your spirit would convict us of of where we stand with you. And I pray your will would be done. I pray for decisions that need to be made, whether in this sanctuary, sitting in, in the car in the parking lot, watching on YouTube, 
Lord, I know that there's decisions that you would have us to make. If God's speaking to your heart, maybe God is, is showing you your need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You've never made that decision. And God is pressing upon your heart that now is the time to confess your sin, to put your faith in Jesus, His sacrifice for you on the cross and the power of His resurrection to make you right with God and to become a child of God. If God's pressing that upon your heart, say this simple prayer. God, forgive me for my sin. Thank you for loving me and for Jesus dying upon the cross to pay the penalty of my sin. I ask Jesus to come into my heart as my Lord and Savior to fill me with His Spirit that I may be a child of God, that I may know you and love you and live for you for this point forward.